Thank you for the introduction, David. You know, we used to say that the three richest guys on the trading floor, trading floor were shoulda, coulda, and woulda. So while you're all lamenting over the fact that you haven't purchased Bitcoin in the last year or so, um, the idea is to you know, continue to inspire you and make sure that you, uh, you know, understand and take away as much as you can. Now, this, tech, this talk is not meant to be a deep talk on technology. It's not meant to be um, investment advice. So as a state registered investment advisor, I have to begin most of my presentations with past performance is no indication of future returns, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but really, this is a 35,000 foot view of Bitcoin and blockchain technology. And my goal is to just leave you some uh, roadmaps, a few high spots, mile markers, that you can draw your own conclusions. And perhaps maybe it won't be tonight. Maybe it'll be another time when you're reading a Wall Street Journal article that the light will come on and you'll be able to get an idea of just how powerful Bitcoin, blockchain, and other digital currencies are. And through the examples I hope to give you, uh, some of the use cases, you'll understand and be able to use that tool yourself. So Bitcoin and blockchain, like many other things, it's a tool, right? It's a solution looking for a problem, and that's not very, uh, that, that's very common. So let's, um, if, can you guys hear me okay with the, the lavaliers? We're up, we're good? Okay. <clears throat> So again, here's the, uh, the disclaimer, regulatory disclaimer about uh, this is not investment advice. We're just talking about this from an educational standpoint through the eyes of an investment advisor, a former floor trader from the Chicago Board Options Exchange, uh, and Bitcoin and blockchain enthusiast. So the presentation is why Bitcoin will disrupt everything. And when I say it's going to disrupt everything, I mean everything. And we're going to get an overlay of, of that. Now, many of you people already have a little bit of an edge. You have an attitude about Bitcoin. All right, the Bitcoin is the dark side. It's money laundering, terrorism, sex and drug trafficking and trading, computer ransom, flight of capital from China. And m mainly, you see Bitcoin as the tool for criminals. How many people would agree that Bitcoin is only a tool for, for, for criminals? Oh, this is going to be a great presentation. OK, you guys are awesome. Um, well, that's good, because I don't always have so many people who are on board with me. And, I was, and usually my response is when everybody raises their hand, well, criminals using Bitcoin, HSBC, one of the largest drug money laundering organizations in the world, was fined $1.9 billion because it enabled Latin America drug cartels to launder billions of dollars through using the US dollar. Okay, uh, Iran, really $1.7 billion in cash, in pallets, on a cargo plane sponsored by the U.S. government going to Iran just a year or two ago? I mean, I heard that, I couldn't believe it. LIBOR scandal, right? Lawsuits going on with uh, London banks, U.S. banks conspiring to keep and in, in, in mark, to market the issues with the LIBOR during 2009 to 2014. So this concept of uh, our trusted institutions always acting in our best interest is something that sometimes doesn't go over very well when you're on the, on the back end of it, right? But when we're in the business, we you know, feel good about Goldman and Morgan and, and these other companies. But you can see Wells Fargo. How many people here remember the shredding parties they had 2008, 2010? They're just shredding all these mortgages. Nobody could follow a trail of what was going on. So again, Bitcoin and blockchain, this immutable technology is going to be an answer to this type of uh, behavior. So I'm going to tell you what I believe. And you're going to laugh when I get through about six or seven of these. Because I believe that, again, when I say Bitcoin and blockchain technology, I'm, I mean the whole kit and caboodle. Other digital currencies, the other apps that sit on top of blockchain. But I believe that it's going to provide financial equality for women. Because if you're a woman that lives in... Afghanistan, Pakistan, some parts of Africa, some parts of South America, you're not allowed to have a checking account or a banking account. Your husband gives you permission to have a checking account. Your husband's needed to walk in in order for you to make a deposit or a withdrawal, if they'll even let you in the bank. Your brother, your father, he controls your, your, your assets. You don't have any rights in many parts of the world if you're a woman. Well, now that's all going to change because a woman will be able to transact economically sending digital currencies without the need of an intermediary, without the need of her father, or brother, or husband. Now, we might find that that's kind of an unusual concept here because I think women, for the most part, while not overly represented at this particular event, you can say you pretty much do whatever you want, right? Uh, um, 
I like to you know, say that my wife, like I might be the head of the family, but she's the neck. And wherever the neck wants to turn the head is where we follow. So women in this country have a lot more power, I think, than, than you might get from the press. But I believe that's going to foster economic inclusion globally, all over the world. And I'll give you an example of that. I believe it's going to improve the dignity of mankind. Because really, dignity is not necessarily about this dollar and cents per se, but it's the opportunity to be able to get involved in human labor and human capital, to be able to express our God-given talents that sometimes we're prevented from doing so because of the organization that we're from, whether it's a political bent, religious uh, problems. So we're going to see just an, an elevation in the dignity of mankind throughout the world. I believe it's going to promote social, social justice to a level that we've never even seen before because social justice is about fairness. For example, if you're a citizen of India, uh, there are four or five caste systems. I'm not exactly sure of the number. I think the bottom two, Mother Teresa's Untouchables, you can't walk step foot in the bank. They wouldn't even let you in the front door. You can't have a job. Right? I mean, even growing up, I remember the, uh, the ethical work issues between, in Ireland, right? Protestant versus Catholic. Protestants had the jobs, Catholic didn't. They're launching bombs at each other. And, and so, I mean, this concept of what religion you are, and what faith you are, what political affiliation you are, what race, what caste system is uh, discriminatory in, in many ways. And again, this is not, maybe not an issue here in the United States, but it's an issue in other places of the world. It's going to increase liquidity in micro lending because there are people all over the planet that have owned thousands of acres, farmland, houses. It's been in their, in their family history for decades, uh, if not you know, a century and a half. But they don't have a piece of paper that shows that they own title to their own land. Uh, I believe it was in the Dominican Republic uh, not that many years ago when a new president came in. He basically got his friends together and said, you pick out the nice pieces of property you want and we're going to title them in your name. Well, what about the people that have owned it for 100 years? Who cares about them? They're nothing. So we're going to be able to use blockchain technology in order to harness uh, assets that normally don't have title. It's going to cure cancers and vaccines. I understand that we have a Bitcoin miner here, someone in, in the audience, this gentleman here in the blue shirt. Is that correct? So why do I say this? Because I'm a, I'm, a I'm a blockchain and cryptocurrency miner as well. We purchase computer equipment that we assemble and we do vast mathematical computations. Well, you've heard about folding DNA. You've heard about biopharmaceuticals using you know, Amazon Web Services or their cloud computing platform in order to trace all these iterations of how molecules might bend and create solutions for cures for cancer and autoimmune diseases. It's going to el eliminate waste and friction in banking. So I'll give you an example. Back in 2013, I gave a presentation on derivatives, you know, options, you know, futures versus options at the London Stock Exchange. And when they paid me my fee after speaking for a week, this London Stock Exchange sent my speaking fee to the Bank of England. The Bank of England sent it to HSBC. HSBC Bank sent it to the Bank of New York. The Bank of New York sent it to my local bank. And after doing business with them for 30 years, I had my mortgage with them. They didn't even know who I was. So to cancel back the whole wire transfer, it took me 26 days to get paid. Now, mind you, we've been doing business with London since like 1776. Why does it take so long to get paid? Why is money being wire transferred take longer than a text message? And that's what we're going to disrupt. Again, if you're a young woman for Pakistan or Afghanistan, you don't get the opportunity of having your own economic identity or ownership. Bitcoin doesn't care what your race, religion, color, caste system you're from, what age you are, what gender, what geography, or what your politics. It's completely blind and agnostic to all that. I pay my son Joseph, who's 17 years old, I pay him in Ethereum to mow the lawn because he doesn't want cash. My gosh, he's got to get on a bike and ride like four blocks to the bank. <laughs> my daughters, I've got a 27-year-old daughter and 25-year-old daughter. When I try to pay them back or we're kind of exchanging, uh, you know, I went to Costco for them and they want to pay me back, do they even have a checkbook? No. They use Venmo. When they go to Starbucks, do they pay with cash? No. They use the Starbucks app. Um, I was with my wife at the um, Merchandise Mart. I went to get a Starbucks and next door was like Argo Tea or something. They don't even accept cash anymore. So everybody's talking about the death of cash. We're in a cashless society. It's already going on. Only 4% of coinage exists in our monetary supply. So don't think that this is something that's all going to happen down the road. 
It's happening now. It's being done today. Bitcoin is censorship resistant. It's transnational, borderless, global, and permissionless. It doesn't need anybody's permission to transfer money. It's completely global. You can send a financial transaction, a financial piece of value to anyone on the globe, any time of the night or day, 24-7, 365, and it only takes a few minutes, and it, the transaction cost is next to nothing. So let's just go back a few years. Bitcoin and blockchain technology is primarily about disruption. So here it is, 1996. Here, here I am in the trading floor of the Chicago Board Options Exchange. I had dark hair, so you probably won't recognize the connection. But we had about 450, almost 500 people in the trading pit. It was the world's largest trading floor, the world's most active option. It was a wonderful, wonderful place to be. And for those people who know Tom Sosnoff from Tasty Trade or TD Ameritrade, Tom stood right, right over here in, in the same area. It was an exciting, incredible place to be. Again, here's another pitch, 1996. The entire trading floor was just jammed with people, elbow to elbow, uh, shoulder to shoulder, trading options. And here it is a year ago. The entire floor is being dismantled. The largest trading floor, the largest OEX pit has maybe 12 guys in it. Most of them are responding to brokers that still walk into the pit, but I'm guessing for most of them, they're just checking their Facebook status and see what's going on. Maybe playing Windows Solitaire but not much happens voice to voice, person to person anymore. It's all done by matching engines from the Chicago Mercantile, matching engines of the CBOE. So this is the new normal that we live in. So Bitcoin is, can't be so strange to you because Uber is the world's largest transportation company with a market cap of between 50 and $70 billion, but they don't own any taxis. Facebook creates no content. Their market cap's about 520 billion. Airbnb, the world's largest uh, Resi not residential, but a services company that provides uh, room and board. Market cap of roughly 50 billion. They don't own any property. Alibaba Group has no inventory. Market cap of 477 billion dollars. So don't tell me that Bitcoin is something strange. It's the world's largest currency. It has no service desk, no government, there's no CEO, and no branches. And that that um, market cap might actually be a little bit low compared to today because I did this presentation like two days ago and we all know what happened to Bitcoin. For those that follow it, it, it dropped precipita precipitously. <clears throat> so where does Bitcoin stand in market cap with other large cap companies in the United States? So we have Apple Computer, market cap, you know, roughly a, almost a trillion dollars. But if, Bit if Bitcoin was in the S&P 500, its market cap is greater than Caterpillar, McDonald's, 3M, IBM, GE, Walt Disney, Coca-Cola, Verizon, Intel, United Healthcare Group, Home Depot, Procter & Gamble, and Chevron. Now, mind you, again, this was done on the 15th, two days ago. Bitcoin is now down to about, well, you know, it hasn't lost that much. Its market cap just rivals Chevron. Who would have thought that a Ponzi scheme, a digital currency that has no value, would be worth as much as Chevron, a company that's been around for like 100 years. They're everywhere. When you talk about big companies, you talk about Chevron. So we're going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin and its history. So the creation of Bitcoin was started on October 31st, 2008. It was a time of great economic distress by an anonymous person or persons named Satoshi Nakamoto. And it came out perfect timing when we had trustless we had, we had trust issues in the economic system. Broker-dealers didn't want to do business with each other or send each other trades or money because he didn't know if it was going to clear on the other side. He didn't know if it was good. He didn't know if you'd get your counterparty trade back. So this concept of sending money or sending value through Bitcoin and blockchain was something that was really important. Well, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the intersection of a peer-to-peer -peer or person-to-person -person network. It's a decentralized ledger, like an Excel spreadsheet or a Google Sheets in some respects. And it's also military-grade, math-based, cryptographic algorithms. So it's a combination of internet protocols, like SMTP when you send mail, or FTP when you send a file, WWW when you're looking up a, a web address. So it's an internet protocol, digital-based math, cryptography, and a decentralized ledger. So Bitcoin is a revolutionary technology which enables a new way to send payment over the internet. You have to think of it as an open accounting system for those here that are CFOs or use QuickBooks. There's a system of thousands of computers all over the world that track ownership of a digital token called Bitcoins. 
Now for each one of these yellow dots that you see, think of the yellow dot as a machine something like this. This is an ant miner machine. This is a machine that mines Bitcoin. You plug it in to the internet, you plug it into your power supply, you log into a web interface, and you're, and you're making Bitcoin, you're mining Bitcoin, you're participating in this economy of validating transactions like a virtu virtual notary public. So all over the world, you have people validating the transactions that happen on the Bitcoin network. So whenever you send someone Bitcoins, the transaction is broadcast to the entire network, and after it's verified, it's recorded on a public ledger available to everybody called a blockchain. It happens almost instantaneously in terms of the transactions being broadcast, but it takes these files, all these transactions, and puts them together in a block. And I'll get to that a little bit later. Again, this is a global, distributed, decentralized platform. There's no one owner. There's no one place to go for Bitcoins. There's, it's, it's, it's run by thousands of volunteers practically. People who are just have machines like this and are running nodes in mining machines. And it gets broadcast to everybody simultaneously. Yes, sir, question? You mentioned value a few minutes ago. Yes. How's that equate to the US dollar, the British pound? I mean, what, what currency is it really? Well, whenever you, or whatever country you're in, you download an app that allows you to get into the Bitcoin network. Like, so when you're in Facebook, right, you need a username and password. You're in LinkedIn, you need a username and password. So when you have a Coinbase account or another type of wallet, once you establish an account, your, the, your location, your local currency is automatically converted into Bitcoin. So the blockchain, right, this massive QuickBooks Online program, and I, and I use that tongue in cheek, is keeping track of every record that has ever occurred since the system began in 2009. It's shared and maintained by everybody on the network, so everyone keeps the books. It's not one set of books that's localized and centralized. So most currencies are issued by a central authority in charge of manning the money supply. Federal Reserve, you know, we would say is at the top of the hierarchy here. We have the member banks of the Federal Reserve below that. And then underneath that, we have the rest of the banks and state banks and any other charters that are in there. So we have very hierarchical money supply. The central authority, Federal Reserve, U.S. Treasury. Congress is supposed to manage the, the value of, of coinage. But they're the ones in charge of managing the money supply. It's a person-to-person -person system so that there's no central authority. Bitcoins are issued to users who help process the transactions of the network. And I'll get to that in a little bit more detail uh, in, in a few minutes. So once again, one of the most critical, important contrib um, uh, attributes of Bitcoin is that it's distributed. Its value really is gained by what gives everything else value, supply and demand. What is the price of bananas? What's the price of apples at the, at the, coffee, at the grocery store? It's about supply and demand. No single institution controls the Bitcoin network. Again, it's a system of volunteers, completely distributed and decentralized. It, it operates outside the confines of a bank holiday and banking fees. And again, people would say, what happens if the internet goes down? Well, I think the internet has gone down less at my house than the ATM machine has for the local bank that I do business with. I think that the internet has um, been a very stable form of, uh, of, of communication. And if the internet goes down, there's an electromagnetic pulse bomb. I mean, I can't solve for every single situation. But you have to figure that, for the most part, the Internet's a pretty s stable form of communication. We do a lot more than just Bitcoin on the Internet. There's all sorts of banking and SWIFT payments going on in, on, uh, on the platform. And you don't need any kind of identity or residency to participate in the Bitcoin network. Yes, sir? So how do you claim your ownership of Bitcoin if you happen to you receive an address. You have a you have a, a, a private key address. You have um, that's, that's basically your identity. But for example, when I when I want to buy something on eBay or PayPal or on the internet, I have to put in my first name, last name, address, zip code, uh, CV, my credit card number, expiration date, my security code. All this personal information has to go in to buy something on uh, on eBay. If I lose that, which I do frequently, is that. <laughs> 
forget my passwords because I've got it, some well, okay, we'll get to that in just a minute. But for Bitcoin, you don't need to submit all that kind of information. You get an, uh, you get an address that on the, on the public ledger that's broadcast all over the world, it has your unique identifier and the number of Bitcoins that you own. And really, you're not really transferring Bitcoin per se. You're transferring ownership of the record of the Bitcoins. So Bitcoin has finally solved the problem of the double spend problem. If I have a dollar and I give it to you, I don't have it, you do. That's the double spend problem. I don't get to manufacture my, my dollars, my physical dollars, like I do an MP3 file or MP4 file, where I can create infinite number of copies. Bitcoin and this algorithm solves the scarcity issue. That's what makes it so exciting for artists, uh, diamond manufacturers, musicians, the sense of providence and sense of ownership. When, when you post a song, if you're a Bruce Springsteen or Lady Gaga, you can create a song that will only have one million possible downloads. You can't cut and paste and make infinite number of somebody else's property. This will allow musicians to get to monetize their work and remain and have control of their work. I think it's really exciting. Once again, here's a concept of Federal Reserve. Very centralized. Federal Reserve says jump, the banking system says how high. Decentralized, kind of like Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, where you share nodes you can text message from one phone carrier to another. It doesn't really interrupt the flow of information. But the system is owned by multiple players. With Bitcoin, it's totally distributed. You can opt in. You can opt out. It doesn't really matter if you're in the system transacting or verifying. The system still works without you. If Sprint goes down, that's a problem. Verizon goes down, that's a problem. If uh, 1,000 Bitcoin miners in China go down, it doesn't really affect anything or anybody. So Bitcoin is when you send money or value from any point in the world to another, instantaneously, securely, without the need of a bank or a credit union or anybody else's permission. It's kind of like a currency system, a payment system and a currency all rolled up into one. So with PayPal, you log into an account and it takes the money out of your bank account and sends it to a vendor for something that you buy. But really, if PayPal could have their own token, if it was really their own currency, you wouldn't need to do two or three transactions. It's just one. Uh, one product that you're sending. So the Bitcoin network runs on a global peer-to-peer -peer distributed ledger system. It's called the blockchain. It's easily assessed from anywhere in the internet. So you can go to any computer at any time, upload your transaction, sir, that you bought or sold something with Bitcoin, and almost instantaneously you'll be able to have a real-time audit trail of that transaction, who, who sent it to you, and even the transactions that another person might have made. The transactions are verified and added to this global blockchain by miners who contribute their computing power to earn a small transaction fee and generate new Bitcoins. And I have a slide uh, right down the road that will explain it a little bit better. So because of this, the, the distributed nature of the blockchain adds this level of redundancy and resiliency that is unmatched in the current processing space. So the SWIFT network has been hacked multiple times. Uh, you know, PayPal, Home Depot, Target, Macy's, all these companies that have a centralized database, they call that the honeypot. Hackers want to break into that because if they can get your identity, your credit card information, they can sell it on the black market. Maybe your credit card information and expiration date goes for a dollar or two, rumor has it, but your healthcare records, don't ask me why, $60, $70 if they can get a hold of that. So Blue Cross and Blue Shield trying to protect your identity and a lifelong worth of hospital records. It's very, very valuable to black market people from what I understand. And again, there's no central point of failure. You can opt in or opt out. It's the perfect system for this age. Another example of central, are there any questions real quick? Anyone, anyone, Bueller? Yes, sir. <laughs> Just to kind of follow up. I, I was reading that there's like $40 billion of Bitcoin value that's locked up and lost because people have lost their, their key numbers. Yes. Will, will never be recovered. Never be recovered unless they get their key back. It's like you had $40 million in your basement and the house caught on fire and you can't get your cash out. $40 billion. $40 billion. Okay. Bitcoin was designed to be a peer-to-peer -peer digital cash. Its attributes are very much like cash. If you leave it in a paper bag and you drop it in the parking lot and someone takes it, it's gone. Right? Your house starts on fire or it catches a water pipe breaks, you can't get your money back. Right? It's the way it is. You go to Craigslist and you buy something, uh, you meet him in a public parking space, and you end up that he gives you a piece of junk for your money, your cash is gone. It's no different. I had another one, another question over here. What is that box doing? 
Uh, it's a, it's a, what does it box, what does it do? This, this box is called a ant miner. And what it does is it, um, it basically downloads Bitcoin files. It performs these mathematical computations and sends it back. The part with Bitcoin, the cryptography that I was telling you about, there's, there's a lot of brute force, high level mathematics that need to be um, performed in order to verify the authenticity and the, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? The authenticity of the actual transactions. So basically what, what MasterCard does and Visa does when you buy and sell your merchant accounts, this Bitcoin miner kind of does that. It takes the file, performs mathematical functions, submits the file back to the network. And every 10 minutes, there's a winner. Someone solved the cryptographic problem, and for that, they, re they receive a reward. So this is just part of the infrastructure, part of the economy of Bitcoin. Is there a comp central company that... Uh, you're just itching to buy that one, aren't you? Well, they're not publicly traded, I don't think. We'll get, we'll get to that. There's, there's opportunities to make money here, and I'll get to that at the very end. So the Federal Reserve calculates the payments of all uh, you know, the bank's banking system. They have a backup system that can be brought back online between 60 and 90 minutes at the Federal Reserve Banks of Richmond and Dallas. But if three of those computer centers went down or destroyed, the monetary system of the United States would definitely stumble for quite some time. I don't know how many people have been down to LaSalle and Jackson, but that Federal Reserve Bank, it is like Fort Knox right now. Yes, sir? I know this is a few years ago, but Mount Gox uh, breached. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, sure. So the, the, the rumor, the theory is that when you, if you have your private keys, you, you own your Bitcoin. If you place your Bitcoins on an exchange or at some other location, someone else is holding them for you, just like cash, you don't really have possession of it. Right? So the Mt. Gox was a, one of the first exchanges where people were buying and selling Bitcoins. And they were, the, the exchange company was getting a fees for that. And people would buy and sell their Bitcoins, but they would leave them on the exchange. And what happened was there was a hack, a breach, and someone was able to come in and scoop up all the Bitcoins that were on that exchange. Now, it wasn't the fault of Bitcoin. The Bitcoin network, the actual, the actual Bitcoin network has never really been hacked where tokens were stolen. It's the other residual external pieces, the exchange that it sits on, it's the wallet that's in your pocket, it's the file that's on your computer. Those are the places that Bitcoin has gotten hacked, but not actually the, the, the network uh, and the, the Bitcoins themselves. Now, compared to the Bitcoin network, it cannot be so easily compromised because there's approximately 11,078 mining nodes or processing centers, and they're being more added every single day. In order for Bitcoin network to be taken out by a physical attack, literally tens of thousands of computers at undisclosed locations on the planet would have to be destroyed. The Bitcoin system is very democratic. It's horizontal. It's peer-to-peer, person-to-person. Its authority is distributed to all users. And the entire system is governed by a mathematical protocol which lays out the rules of the system. Uh, it will never, it'll, it'll never favor one set of people over another because the users and everybody has an equal, it's like, who, who wants to be a millionaire? Everybody has, when you pull the audience, we all have equal rights. Yes, sir? Yes. Yes. I encourage you to do it. That's awesome. Yes, do it. Be a part of it. Be a part of the. Be a, be a be a miner. Be a part of the system. You're adding more and more strength for every single one of these ant miners. Or you decide to get into cryptocurrency mining. It only adds strength and resiliency to the, to the system because we don't know where you live. You'll be able to participate in a distributed currency, a global currency, and you don't need a license. You don't need a bank. Can you open up? Can anybody here in this room open up a bank? I doubt it. Even if you had the capital, there's rules that would prevent you from doing it. You just can't. No Joe Blow can come off the street and open up a bank. You ha already have to be a CEO of a bank or already have done this before to have the right to, to be a part of the system. So I encourage you, sir, yes, you should be a part of it. Next question. Can you explain the fact that you're not completely screwed with your private key? Because I think from my, like an annual ledger S. Yes. Um, your question is, how do I tell people? Can you ask, rephrase the question again, please? 
Yes. Yes, yes, yes. 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 So, okay, so the question he's asking is, you know, let people know that you're not completely screwed if you lose your private key. I believe that was your question. All right, so with, 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 just like you have two keys when you go into a safety deposit box in a bank, one belongs to you, one belongs to the bank. Bitcoin shares the same type of cryptography. It's called public key cryptography. It's called asymmetric cryptography, which means that it isn't like a two-way street. If I have my private key, and I'm able to access a public key, we can put them together and we can perform a transaction. But if I have a Coinbase account or I have another account online, they hold my private key. So therefore, theoretically, their organization, their app can be hacked, I can lose my Bitcoin. But what this gentleman is talking about is you can buy something that looks like a USB stick and your private key you hold and maintain ownership of. Therefore, if you lose the key in a fire or flood, as long as you have your 12 word uh, C generator, your password generator, you'll be able to recover your bitcoins. So, it, so if you have possession of your private key, you have your bitcoins. If you don't have possession of your private key, you don't have your bitcoin. Yes, sir. So the service fee that's paid to the bitcoin miner, yes, is that comes out of the value of all the bitcoins. Yes, okay. yes, it's generated by the bitcoin. So people say. Uh, and I also need a timekeeper here because I want to take a five minute break at 430. All right, so Bitcoin, it has no value. What's it worth? What backs it? Okay, what backs the US dollar? We haven't been on the gold standard since uh, 1933. We were only on the gold standard for 54 years. Richard Nixon closed the window to the gold, uh, the gold window in the 1970s to international people. So you take out a dollar bill, what does it say? Backed by the US park system? Backed by the, the, the bean at, at Navy Pier? Backed by the real estate value of, of the Empire State Building or the Federal Building, the Pentagon? No. Full faith and credit of the U.S. government. It's the debt. It's our, our, our credit rating that guarantees the currency. So I know everybody was worried about the value of Bitcoin, but, bit, but value is a perception. It's an agreed upon contract. It's a social contract. But this world needs... The, the financial services system needs disruption badly. We have roughly three billion global citizens with no banking facilities. Two and a half billion or more are underbanked without a credit or a, an ID. They can't prove who they are. They don't have title to their property. There may not even be a bank within 200 miles of where they live. Western Union charges between 7 and 30% to send money from here to the Philippines or from here to Africa. Nicaragua, 60% of the population lives below the poverty line. Only 19% of them have a formal bank account. 14% are able to borrow money, and 93% of them own prepaid cell phones. So you might not have clean water, you might not have a floor in your house, you might not have food or clothing or decent education or a bank account, but you have a cell phone and that's all you need. So blockchain technology. So all the assets are defined and governed by a mathematical protocol, which acts as a person-to-person -person distributed ledger. That's called the blockchain. Bitcoin is considered the father of digital assets because Bitcoin was the first function, the first application on the blockchain. So I send money to David Burke. That transaction is configured into a block of transactions, which is um, supported by this miner. The transaction is broadcast throughout the entire network, all over the globe to hundreds of, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of machines. David receives uh, the funds from me. The double entry ledger takes it away from my account, my address, and gives it to David Burke. And then that particular transaction, every 10 minutes, is added into a public history. So think of blockchain sort of as like an Excel spreadsheet with a tab that's been generated every 10 minutes, going back for every single transaction, immutably recorded on the internet, going back to 2008. It's kind of like that. But an Excel spreadsheet resides locally on my computer. It resides, it's a centralized location. If I were to do the same thing, say, for Google Sheets. How many here use Google Sheets? Google Sheets. If I have 10 people in a room and I share a file with them, the second I type in one cell and I hit enter, it gets broadcast to everybody else almost instantaneously. That's another form of that's closer to distributed. It's not like a file that's on my computer that I have to email or upload to a, a server. Google Sheets, Google Network, Google 
web services, they host that file for me. I could have 100 people, probably 1,000 people, all sharing the same spreadsheet. And as soon as I hit enter, it gets broadcast. But there's still a central, central point of failure. It's the Google system. With Bitcoin, there is no central location. Everybody has a copy of the ledger, so it's virtually impossible for it to go down. So again, here's an example of a centralized ledger, Excel spreadsheet. This is what a Bitcoin transaction kind of looks like. Here's the buyer's address, the sender's address, the amount sent, the amount received, and the transaction fee. Very, very simple information. Every transaction, about 10 transactions a second, come into this file. At the end of 10 minutes, it's pretty much locked up and moved over to a small queue where all this cryptographic mathematical formulas are, are done and performed to make sure that everybody agrees on consensus that this was the input, the output, and the transaction fee, right? And then we move on to a new tab in block two, a new tab in block three, every 10 minutes. And if you were to go back, one block points to the next block, which points to the next block, which points to the next block. So there's this chain of blocks. Each block of information is chained to the one before it and it's immutably recorded on this global network. So if we were to look today, uh, this spreadsheet says that Bitcoin has had 457,000 blocks. I think that number is up around 475,000 blocks of information. Everyone, every block that you look at today has an address and a pointer going to the one before it and the one before it, so that every single transaction ever recorded on the Bitcoin network is available. Is there any computer constraints? Are there any computer constraints? Mm. This ledger seems like it's... It, it, it's true. So um, there's, um, you know like a teeter-totter between bonds and yield. So bond prices go up, yields go down. Yields go up, bonds go down. It's this inverse relationship. The Bitcoin file is relatively small, somewhere between you know, one megabyte, maybe two megabytes in size, okay? The actual file each block, but it takes days to download the entire uh, uh, ledger, the history of the ledger. So in terms of a miner, it's computationally intensive, but you don't need that much memory to operate it. So if you're going to be what's called a node, you want to be a, a, a larger player, you want to participate in a different way. Uh, maybe you like to make your own craft beer rather than buy craft beer, right? You want to be a part of the economy. You can download the entire Bitcoin file and it, might, it may take some time. So there's no, mm, there's, there's a little bit of constraint, but they're working on that uh, right now, the developers of the Bitcoin protocol. So the Google Sheets, again, is a decentralized, yes, sir? Sorry, it's the transaction fee. It's not really a corporation. That's a great question, and I wish I could answer that for you, because I'm a Bitcoin miner, and I don't think I'm getting transactions, and I mine Ethereum and other things. I'm not getting a transaction fee. I get a reward for, for being a part of the process. And I also am uh, partners with a gentleman that we have our own mining pool. When I ask him, hey, Corey, who gets the transaction fee? He says, the network. Well, that's not a good enough answer for me. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe this gentleman can answer that. But I'm not exactly sure who gets the transaction fee. You can buy them on eBay, Craigslist, get them from a company overseas. Again, you don't need anybody's permission to do this. Yes, sir? I, I know that as a, being a part of a, a Bitcoin pool and a mining pool, we were sharing the reward once a block is issued, but we're not getting this, this little bits and pieces of transaction fees. And that's my quest for 2018, to find someone smart enough to tell me where, who really gets the transaction fees. It's like a 12B1 fee in a mutual fund. Somebody's getting it, you just don't know who. Yes, sir? <laughs> You know, it's, it's a, it's a not-for-profit organization called the Bitcoin Foundation. They have a group of developers that are always trying to update the Bitcoin protocol. But remember, it's open source. It's wide open to anybody. You can, you can download the Bitcoin uh, protocol. You can download the file. You can create your own cryptocurrency in like a weekend if you were smart enough. So it's completely open source, completely transparent. Yes, ma'am. How do you determine the transaction fee? The transaction fee is not dollar-based on the size of the money you send. So you can send $10 or a billion dollars. It's the size of the file and how backed up the network is to process the fees. So it's more like uh, the more clogged, the more transactions there are, the fee goes up. Um, but, and, and that's an issue that needs to be addressed.
So I already gave the example of, coin, of, of Google Sheets. Again, it's a decentralized ledger, but it resides on the Google servers. Here's another example of a blockchain uh, uh, transaction from the internet. You want to go and do a Google search for Bitcoin blockchain transactions or Bitcoin block explorer, you can watch these transactions scroll down 24-7, 365. And again, all the information of the buyer address, seller address, how many confirmations it took, and all the fees that are involved. Oh, oh okay, good. For, let's take a five minute break, get a cup of glass of water. We'll be okay. How are we doing on time? Perfect. All right, take five minutes out. Let's stretch. It's kind of hot in here.